Well, thank you, Tony. Good to hear you again. Uh, Tony sang, you know, I, I'm always amazed, how do you sing and play at the same time? I mean, somebody, you know, can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, but you, you have that amazing talent. I'm, I, I love these uh, Bible narrative songs. I mean, they just make it come alive. Well, uh, I am your new interim pastor. And, uh, yeah, thank you. I, I, I assume that's why so many were sitting further toward the back to make a good getaway quickly. But uh, it is a joy to be with you. Thank you for your affirmation. And uh, my wife, Janet, is thrilled, looking forward to meeting you and being here. Uh, we want to be praying for the search team because they had an unusual opportunity tonight to hear a prospective pastor. And uh, I, I have no, out of town, I have no idea uh, what the Lord is up to, but we do want to pray for them and pray for this journey of finding God's man. And as I said this morning, even if uh, the Lord calls someone before I could ever be here on the field, I'm excited for what the Lord is doing because we do want to pray for His will to be done. I want you to tonight to turn to Romans chapter 15. Romans 15, verse 22 to verse 33. It's good to hear these wonderful instrumentalists and to hear the organ and the piano. My wife was a keyboard major as well as a, a music major in college. She was a, a pipe organ performance major. But there aren't many pipe organs around. And uh, she, we actually had a church or two that had a pipe organ that we were in. But uh, that was a wonderful sound to hear those two great instruments, the organ and the piano. In 1998, all eyes were on history's oldest astronaut. John Glenn went into space once again. In 1962, he was the first American to orbit the Earth. And then 38 years or so later, he is once again going into outer space. He said that his greatest concern was uh, in that, that second time that he had to give 12 blood samples at zero gravity. And he said to his doctor, please pray for me. Well, when John Glenn went into outer space, Walter Cronkite left his usual anchorman cool and said, go, baby, go. But the thing that is remembered the most was when Scott Carpenter, another astronaut, said, Godspeed, John Glenn. Well, we are not going into a journey into outer space in this ministry. Paul the Apostle was not going to the moon or Mars. He was going to Rome. And he wanted to go on to Spain. And in one of the most significant passages in the book of Romans. Paul talks about the kind of journey that we're on right now. And as I was praying, there, uh, there are many, many passages that I could have preached on today. But I was particularly struck by how God is saying to us, Godspeed on your journey. Let's stand as we honor the reading of God's inspired word in Romans 15, verses 22 to 33. I remember someone saying to me one time, you read more scripture in your text than any preacher I've ever heard. That's because we're trying to hear the whole text in its context. I hope that it doesn't bore you. The Bible says give attendance to the reading of God's word. And so let's look at Romans 15, beginning in verse 22. Paul said, for this reason I have often been prevented from coming to you, but now with no further place for me in these regions... And since I've had for many years a longing to come to you whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they're indebted to minister to them also in material things. Therefore, when I have finished this and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on by way of you to Spain. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints, so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And it is my joy to come to you by way of Naples, Florida, and to be blessed by you for a while. You may be seated. Now, Paul was constantly wanting to be in the will of God. I heard, or rather I read some years ago, an author saying that we don't need to worry about the will of God. If we just surrender to the Lord, it'll all take care of itself. But Paul made the statement that he wanted to come to them by the will of God, that it was important that he not miss the will of God. And that's why Jesus said simply that as the Father has sent me, I have come by the will of Him who sent me. Now, uh, I, I know some of you, when you talk about God's journey in life, it may seem like drawing blood at zero gravity. It may feel like you're going into outer space when, it, when you're talking about God's steps. But remember, Psalm 37 says the steps of a good man or a good woman are ordered by the Lord. I want to talk to you about God's speed on your journey. Now, first of all, God's speed, because God has a plan we would never have envisioned. God has a plan that we would never, ever have envisioned. Now, it's usually different from what we expected. Paul talked about going to Jerusalem to serve the saints. He said, it is important that we remember the poor. And all of us would say amen to that. That God calls us to have compassion ten times in the gospel. It's the gospels, it says that Jesus had compassion on people. Paul and Barnabas had gone to Jerusalem earlier. Uh, there was a tremendous famine in the land, you may remember. Uh, they were going through great hardship, according to Acts chapter 11 and 12. But now Paul has another offering to help the needy in Jerusalem because the Gentiles have given funds to help the, the believers, the church in Jerusalem. They felt indebted to them. They had been prejudiced. Uh, prejudice had been directed to them. They were called dogs, as you know, being Gentiles. But the Christians had the compassion of Christ. And they felt in the body the need to minister to them. But Paul had an unexpected way to get to Rome and finally to leave Jerusalem. You remember when he came to Jerusalem, a mob was stirred up by the religious leaders, and they accused him of bringing a Gentile into the temple and that he had defiled the temple, Acts 21, 28. They mobbed him. But the Romans took him seriously. They gave him a fair shake. They said, all right, let's hear what, uh, what's going on. He said, I'm a citizen of Rome. And so they, they gave him special attention. Paul appealed to Caesar. He went through God's protection from an ambush. And then over about two years' time, languished in prison and finally went to Rome by way of a shipwreck, a hurricane, a snake bite, and all the other things Satan could throw against him. But Paul said, I, I don't know how God's ways will work out, but it is my desire to come to you. I have seen that God has unusual ways of getting people to do certain things 
and go to certain places. I talked to you this morning about how the Lord used a, a lawyer friend of mine to talk to your former pastor, to talk to your search committee chairman, to put in our, lo- our heart a love for uh, North Carolina. I've not preached that much in North Carolina, but it's a joy to be here. C.T. Studd was a great missionary of yesteryear. And C.T. Studd had served for eight years in India. He came back home and he saw an ad in the newspaper that said this, cannibals want missionaries. Now that wouldn't be very appealing to me. But he uh, uh, somehow in that play of words, he sensed the call of God to Africa. His wife struggled with it. He didn't have an organization to back him. He had no money, but he sensed that God wanted him, that God wanted him for those cannibals, and he went to Africa. God has usually different ways of directing us, but these are often difficult ways. And as a result of this this attack by the people in, in Jerusalem, he went to jail, and then he went to Rome. And Paul talks about this. He said, I've often been prevented from coming to you. If you would look with me for a moment in 1 Thessalonians, uh, just turn over there for a moment. Paul talked about this in 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, verse 16. And many of us would say, this is what I've experienced in my life as well. He said that, Uh, These evil men had uh, killed, had hindered uh, him. They killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but are hostile to all men, hindering them from speaking as the Gentiles so that they may be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the utmost." Evil people hindered Paul. Evil people drove him out. Evil people killed Jesus and crucified him. But the Bible says it was God's will for him to suffer. God is so great, so big, and so loving that he can make grace out of mess. God can turn the attacks of evil people to a godly purpose. I've seen it, haven't you? And yet Satan tries to hinder us. Satan throws roadblocks at our path. And then right down uh, in this passage, in chapter 2, verse 18, he said, but Satan hindered us. And that was a word to cut in on someone who was running. I remember uh, I was a runner in high school as well as some other things. And I remember how when when you're running, another runner will try to cut in on you. He can even trip you up. He can throw an elbow at you. And that's what what, uh, Paul is saying Satan had done to them. God's ways are different and often difficult. But he said, I know that there will be a refreshing enjoyment in your company in chapter 15, 32 of uh, Romans. Godspeed. The journey may be difficult, but God is right there with you. But secondly, Godspeed. God connects us with people that we have never engaged. He allows us to have experiences we never would have imagined. But he also has a spiritual network, not a social network, but a spiritual network, and he brings us to get to know people along in our journey. Isn't that a great thing to know? In chapter 16, he will actually pin his longest list of names that he's greeting. 24 people by name, five households, men and women, older Christians, younger Christians, mature, young in the Lord, whole uh, groups of people and individuals, because Paul knew the importance of relationships. And you know, that's what I've sensed in this church. I sense there is a warmth and a friendliness here, and we thank God for that. And this is one of the great platforms that you can build on, is that sense of warmth. Do you know that not long ago, Ohio State University did a study, and they found that friendship literally supports the immune system. 
and prevents disease. That's, that's a wonderful thing. And so Paul said that uh, as he's greeting these people, it's important that they have connection. And so he writes to them. He said, you know, uh, there, they, I've had a longing to come to you. I have felt squeezed and pushed out of the ministry that I had earlier, but God has opened a door for me to come to you. And he communicates to them. He speaks to them because God is, is giving a relationship with them. I have seen, haven't you, how the Lord will allow us to have opportunities to meet people. And the Lord uses uh, churches to be launching pads of ministry. This is one reason why I love missions, because in missions, we are fulfilling the Great Commission, and we're doing some things we may never get to do, but by giving and praying and connecting, the Lord allows us to share the gospel. Jesus talks about how the gospel and his righteousness are so important. It was Paul's passion to share the gospel with people. He talks about Phoebe, if you look Roman, in Romans chapter 16 for just a moment. He begins by saying, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea, that you receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her. Uh, a, a servant of the Lord. A servant is one who does the commands of another. And he talks about Phoebe because uh, she was a helper of many, a servant of the church. Uh, and he said, therefore, help her. She herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well, in verse 2. You know, that's an interesting word, a helper. It had two ideas in the original language. One was the idea of a sponsor who sponsors an athlete in the games, like the Olympic Games or the Corinthian Games. And then it was the idea of a trainer. It was someone who comes along and helps and trains. Someone gets a, a, a torn knee or a leg cramp, and that trainer comes out of the field. In our ministry in, in Naples, we developed a Christian school, First Baptist Academy, and it went from preschool all the way through high school. We were able to build a, a, compl a sports complex that had football and soccer and track and all of these things. But we also realized our football team needed a trainer. And so we were able to bring in a, a trainer uh, who was, was literally trained in training and uh, I, many a time I would see that person uh, uh, having struggles out on the field, and she would go out to that young man and help that player off the field and check him out. But far better than that was the doctor, the orthopedic surgeon, who was on the sidelines. And one time I saw a, a young man go down with a serious knee injury, and that doctor went straight out on the field before the coach could even get there and stabilized his knee. That's exactly what Phoebe did. She was a helper, a trainer, an encourager. And I believe God wants us to do that. And I want to urge you that this be a church that is the greatest possible church in the area of helping and encouraging. I've sensed it already in my life. It's amazing, though, also, because God gives us relationships. About uh, six, seven years ago, the Lord put on my heart a desire to reach out to missionaries and denominational leaders in our Southern Baptist Convention. And I, I designed what I call the Great Commission Connection. And we had volunteers. We shared the vision of ministering and being Phoebe's encouragers and trainers. And so we assigned a seminary professor or a denominational leader, a North American missionary, and an international missionary to each person who committed to be a connector. And one of our ladies was doc that we uh, enlisted in the program was Dr. Dulcie Dudley. And Dr. Dudley began 
by writing certain missionaries in Guatemala and eventually not only praying for them, but she was actually invited to come down and help with the children in Guatemala. But it wasn't just that she would go down. She came back and she said, I need to take others with me. And so she began a ministry to Guatemala to orphan children and, and associating with a ministry called One More Child. As a result of that, numerous trips every year go down to Guatemala and minister to those children. And two of my children and grandchildren and wife have gone down there. It's now spread to South Africa, and God is using. But it all began with Dulcie Dudley, who actually happens to be a pediatrician, connecting with an international missionary, praying for that missionary, but getting those children on her heart and becoming a Phoebe. But here's another big idea, the main principle. God's speed, He connects us with opportunities we never, ever imagined we'd have. Do you realize that Phoebe carried the letter of Romans to that church? Can you imagine that? God uses His women as well as His men, and she is entrusted with the major theological explanation in the entire Bible of what the gospel is all about. She, she carried the letter of Romans, and amazingly, with no armed guard, no security detail, no military escort, not even a big, bad, muscular Christian from Corinth who knew martial arts and was packing heat. No, by herself in a strange city, she couldn't call up Siri and give the address and punch it in and find out where to go. No, she by herself, led by God, took the letter of Romans to the church. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine? Ladies, could you imagine God saying, listen, this is my most important message and explanation of the gospel. Now, take it with you, Godspeed. You never know the opportunities that God is going to open up. When we were in South Africa this summer, my wife and I and our 12-year-old granddaughter and uh, 20 folks from First Baptist Naples we went to Cape Town, and Janet had been there last year, and she said, we've just got to go back as a group. And so we took this team. And my little 12-year-old granddaughter, Mary Grace, feels called to missions and ministry overseas. And so uh, we linked up with a ministry called Living Hope that ministers to children, to uh, the needy in Cape Town, in the townships, dealing with health care, food, the gospel, of course. Everything is designed to share Jesus with people there. And we work with a man named John Averett. John Averett leads Living Hope Ministry. And this is so cool, folks, because uh, John felt led to leave his pastorate and, and develop this ministry. And now with 200 staff, they are the leading Christian helping organization in South Africa. Now, Nelson Mandela, we've all heard of Nelson Mandela. In South Africa, Nelson Mandela is like a combination of uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Ronald Reagan. I mean, he is the man in South Africa. Yeah, they're president. I mean, it, you cannot even fathom how uh, is significant his leadership is and how esteemed he is. And so when he was inaugurated to be president of South Africa, after all those years of apartheid and all the years Mandela was in prison, John Averett, my white South African pastor friend, was invited to come to a special ceremony of the inauguration. He thought, well, there are going to be a lot of other pastors there. No. He was the only pastor in the entire group. And he sat next to President Bill Clinton. And he wondered, why in the world am I here? But the Holy Spirit had connected him. And Nelson Mandela came up to John and he said to him, I know you, 
And John Averett said, how do you know me? I, I, don't, I have never met you, Mr. President. And he said, yes, I know you. I have listened to you on television in your ministry. I can't go to church because of, of the crowd and the mob around me. But every week I tune in and I listen to you. You're my pastor. That blew me away when he shared that. He doesn't make a big deal out of it. But can you imagine, God connects us with opportunities that we never imagined. Who knows what God is going to do with you this week? And then fourth, Godspeed. He calls us to give in ways we have never expressed before. Paul was taking a gift for the poor. In verse 26, a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. And that word contribution has at its root the idea of fellowship, koinonia. You've heard that word. The commonness that we have in Christ. And so when we give, we give out of our relationship in the body of Christ to one another. I realize that uh, talking somehow about giving is, is threatening to a lot of people. But you see, it's part of our priestly ministry of worship. That's what Paul said here. We worship through giving. In verse 16, he talked about the Gentiles. Let's look back at Romans 15. In verse 16, he said this, uh, that this was given, the grace was given to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest, the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In other words, like the priest laying the animal sacrifice on the altar, he said, uh, my contribution, your contribution, is a gift of worship to God. We're dying to self when we give. And all of us can do this. He said, all can give with the right attitude and with the right joy and worship. And he said, look at verse 26. He said to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. And he talked about Macedonia and Achaia. These were poor churches. These were not the rich Christians. They were pleased to do so, he said in verse 27. And they are indebted to them. They were pleased. It was a joy to give. The Bible speaks of hilarious giving. You know what? I, my prayer is that Trinity Baptist Church will give more during this interim time than we've ever given in the past. I'd love to see us give more to the North Carolina missions effort, more to international missions, more in weekly ministry than we've ever done before. But I guarantee you, that all of us have to be involved. All of us have to say, Lord, here am I. I present myself on the altar. And it simply means saying yes to a greater thing by saying no to lesser things. Do you realize that Americans spend more on dog food every 52 days than they do on missions in the entire year. 90% of Americans give only $1.50 a month. I'm talking about American Christians, so-called. $1.50 a month to missions. That's pathetic, isn't it? How is it that we value our pets over the loss that Jesus died for? But it means that some of us are to take seriously the opportunity to do more than we ever imagined. The fr frankly, whenever there's a grand piano to move, somebody's always willing to carry the stool. Right? Amen. But Paul said, listen, we're all in this together. We can all do it together. It's interesting that it talks about uh, in Romans chapter 16, two men, Gaius and Erastus. Now, these men, that doesn't mean anything to us. But Gaius was the man who had the church in his home, and is probably where Paul stayed when he went to Rome. Erastus was treasurer in Corinth. 
He was a big deal. As a matter of fact, he was a significant helper in the ministry. They found in 1929 in the city of Corinth, which I visited some time ago, a Latin inscription found engraved on a marble pavement stone. And here's what the inscription said. Erastus, commissioner for public works, laid this pavement at his own expense. At his own expense. Let me share one, one final thing. Godspeed, because God compels us to pray with power that can never be stopped. It cannot be ignored. And that's why Paul ends this discussion of the, the spiritual journey we take by asking for prayer. We pray with Christ's motivation. He said in verse 30, I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. It's motivated by Jesus. Someone asked uh, David Livingston, the famous missionary to Africa, who pioneered much of the uh, middle part of Africa, why he did it. And here's what he said. By the way, he had for 33 years suffered unbelievable hardship, attacks by lions, by natives, uh, the death of his wife, loss of supplies, uh, disease, theft, Imagine all these things. He said, people talk about the sacrifices I have made. It is emphatically no sacrifice. It is a privilege. If he who left his home in glory could do that for me, it is no sacrifice for me to do what I do for him. But we also pray with Christ-like intercession. It means we have the right passion. It means that we are striving together. That's the word agonizza. It's the idea that of a wrestler, and uh, he's in these Greek games. He's wrestling. He's striving. You know, it wasn't just because they lost a game. If uh, he lost in certain games, that wrestler's eyes would be gouged out. And they're striving. He said, you're striving because there is difficulty, there is persecution, there's pressure brought on by these evil people and by Satan himself. Strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. That is prayer, to God for one another. To God by all of us together in prayer. And I'm going to ask that you pray for the Wicker family, that you hold us up because there are vast challenges in ministry today that people have no idea of. Satan attacks us all the time in ways that you cannot even ma imagine. But I have seen the power of prayer, haven't you? I want us to, to just bathe this ministry in prayer. I want us to call out to God and cry out to Him and say, Lord, we want to see Your power and Your presence manifested. Strive together with me, with us, in prayer. It makes all the difference in the world. When the Bible uses the term to call out to God, it is a verbal crying out in desperation. Call to me, God said, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not of. We're facing radical resistance and spiritual resistance. We need to pray for our missionaries. Pray for our ministers. Pray for your Sunday school teacher. Pray and see the power of God fall. When I was in the doctoral program in seminary, I felt that God had called me to make a special study in the area of prayer. And so my, my primary dissertation was about prayer in different aspects. And when I finished all that study and that several years of, of work, 
I realize I, I hardly know anything about real prayer. And the more I've grown in the Lord and the longer I've gone, the older I get, the more I realize it is a constant journey in discovery. And we have seen times when if we could not cry out to God and get answers, I don't know what we'd do. I was driving through West Kansas a few days ago, and we went near a town where I had preached a revival back in the 80s, a revival meeting when I was at First Baptist Lubbock, Texas. And just before the service one night, I called my wife just to see how they were doing. Our, our young oldest daughter was there in the kitchen, and our, uh, our little toddler, Allison, was up on, a, uh, on the counter. And as I'm talking to Janet, all of a sudden I, I hear her drop the phone and scream. Allison had fallen off the counter, hit her head, and stopped breathing. My daughter yelled something in the phone, and it went dead. Janet picked that little girl up and ran crying out to God, Jesus, Jesus, save my baby. She ran next door to our neighbor who was a nurse, not at home, crying out to God. And here I am in Kansas with my little four-year-old, my little son, supposedly going to preach a sermon in a few minutes at a church. And we called out to God. I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea how bad it was if my child was even alive. But we were crying out to God in the name of Jesus to be merciful and powerful. And somehow in that running to and from that neighbor, it, it jolted Allison and she started breathing again. And then Janet could call and let me know. It happened two or three other times, to be honest with you. Pretty scary. Pretty scary. But we realize that we have a prayer answering God. Let's go to Him right now. And I say to you, Godspeed in our journey together. I don't know what your prayer need is. But let's just take a moment before we give an invitation. If anyone feels called of God to come and make a decision for Christ, we want to be here for you. But how many of you, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, would say to me, Hayes, or Dr. Wicker, or Pastor Hayes, whatever you want to call me, I have a really desperate, serious prayer request, prayer need. Could I just see your hand? Yes. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're crying out to God. Anyone else? I mean, you. the moment I talked about this, you knew exactly what you were asking from God. Paul said that he was praying that God would deliver him from these evil men, these evil people, and that his offering would be acceptable. What are you asking of God? Let's, let's be really specific tonight and ask specifically for that thing that you need. Just tell God what you need. Be willing to ask him. Lay it out before him right now.